everyone and welcome to uh, the lecture on Sub-Saharan Africa. We're going to split this one into two lectures because it's a bit long. Um, so let us first take a look at the physiographic map. Um, the African continent is divided into two geographic realms. We'll be looking at Sub-Saharan Africa first. This region, as its name suggests, lies directly south of the, of the Sahara Desert. The northern part of Africa shares a lot of similarities with Southwest Asia. So these two regions are another realm entirely. But if we take Africa as a whole, the continent accounts for about one-fifth of the Earth's entire land surface. From north to south, we're looking at around 4,800 miles, and from the eastern point of the westernmost point to the westernmost point, we have about 4,500 miles. Because of these distances, much of Africa is far from maritime sources of moisture, so water supply is a major issue for the continent. Um, Africa is the only continent that does not have a mountain backbone. It is one of two continents that include a, a cluster of Great Lakes lying in deep trenches called rift valleys. Rift valleys are formed when parallel cracks or faults appear in the Earth's crust, and the area between the crust sinks to form linear valleys. We also refer to Africa as the Plateau Continent, since almost the entire continent lies about, above 1,000 feet in elevation. Here's a larger map of the physiography with uh, plateaus and basins. If we look at this map, we can see these rifts and the basins and plateaus that formed around and between them. All of Earth's continents were once part of supercontinent Pangaea. Plate tectonics split Pangaea apart and continue their work on Africa today. All of the unique geographical features of the continent relate to Africa's central location in Pangaea. Africa is where human evolution began. We found our first communities on this continent, and our ancestor hominids eventually spread forward to Eurasia more than two million years ago. But due to lack of written history, we know relatively little about this region from 5,000 to 500 years ago. And 500 years ago is when the colonial period began. Influences from Europe destroyed African traditions and artifacts in an attempt to civilize the inhabitants, which is ironic because Africa is where civilization began. West Africa was the source of a great deal of early trade. Since there is a contrast in environments and modes of life, we see the rise of regional complementarity between peoples within this continent, and the rise of markets and urban centers, such as Timbuktu. Ancient Ghana was one of the states that arose between the 9th and 12th centuries AD, and included a large capital city, suburbs, and religious shrines before the Muslims invaded in 1067 and eventually broke it into smaller units. Eventually, the politico-territorial focus of the West African culture hearth shifted to the east, perhaps in part due to the rise of Islam. We also see early states emerging in the locations of present-day Sudan, Eritrea, and Ethiopia, which were influenced by the Egyptian cultural hearth. State formation begun to ha began to happen and was in progress when Europeans made contact in the late 1400s. The ethnic uh, areas map shows us how Africa has always been a realm of rich and varied cultures, diverse lifestyles, technological progress, and external trade. But because it was so fragmented, it was easily susceptible to European intervention. The Atlantic slave trade originated in West Africa, where Europeans traded with African intermediaries for the slaves who would eventually wind up working on plantations in North, Middle, and South America. Millions of Africans were forced to leave their homelands and were sent to the U.S., the Caribbean Basin, and Brazil, taking a relatively short journey. Although slavery and slave trading were not new to the continent, the European slave trade far exceeded earlier slave trade in volume, destroying families and villages and cultures. Here. In this larger map of the Atlantic slave trade, we can see the volume and destinations of the slaves. We can see the highest volume heading to Brazil. In the second half of the 1800s, European powers began to take over African lands. There was a conference in Berlin in 1884 to carve up the continent between the major colonial contestants, Britain, France, Portugal, Belgium, and Germany. Each country governed their colonies in different ways, from democracies to dictatorships. The Belgians were especially harsh to the people who inhabited the Congo, killing 10 million Congolese during the murderous reign of King Leopold II. The Berlin Conference divided culture groups, united regions were ripped apart, unified regions were ripped apart, and bounded hostile societies together. This would have a lasting impact even after decolonization. 
Here's a larger map of colonization that shows us the process by which the African continent was carved up through the 19th and early 20th centuries and the process of decolonization that has been taking place since the 1960s. Climatic regions in Africa are nearly symmetrically distributed across the equator. Elevation tempers equatorial climate in the east and farther north or south from equatorial Congo, dry seasons grow longer. Deserts are on the northern and southern sides of the continent. Our climate map shows us that the northern part of the continent lies in the dry climate zone, and the middle and southern parts are a mix of humid equatorial and humid temperate. Destruction of the natural environment is due in large part to European coloners, colonizers who introduced the concept, concept of hunting as sport, killing off entire populations of animals and disrupting the na natural ecosystems. Many species are now near extinction. Our population map shows that this is not a densely populated realm. There are many centers, major centers of population, such as Nigeria, East Africa, and the Horn. All of the countries of Sub-Saharan Africa combined have a population about two-thirds the size of China's. Much of the population depends on farming, despite the fact that much of the environment does not quite lend itself to farming. We're mostly looking at subsistence farming. However, despite talks of free trade, African farmers don't get a fair opportunity to participate in world markets. Land is owned in Africa via a process called land tenure, where communities and not individuals hold land. Occupants have temporary rights to land and cannot sell it. This has been complicated since the Europeans came in with their concept of land ownership, and through the buying and selling of land, things have become complicated once the Europeans left. We don't have a lot of commercial farming in Africa. The major crops are maize, millet, and root crops, and there is some livestock herding. Government policies complicate things, and the so-called Green Revolution has not yet had a major impact on Africa. Tropical Africa is a source of area of many serious illnesses. When a disease outbreak has local or regional dimensions, it's called an epidemic. When it spreads worldwide, it's known as a pandemic. The most deadly disease of Africa in the world is malaria, which kills a million people each year, and most of these are children under five. AIDS erupted in Sub-Saharan Africa before becoming a pandemic, and by the early 1990s, it spread in equatorial and East Africa in the, quote, AIDS belt from the Congo to Kenya. In 2012, South Africa, Nigeria, Mozambique, Tanzania, Zimbabwe contained the largest HIV-infected national populations. There are more than a thousand languages in Sub-Saharan Africa. Many do not have a written tradition, which makes mapping and classification difficult. The map we are looking at is an estimation, where the dominant language family is the Niger-Congo family, which extends from west to east in southern Africa. The Nilo-Saharan family lies to the north of the Niger-Congo, and the Afro-Asiatic family encompasses much of the region we will be studying next. Uh, Hausa is a common language in the West African savanna, and Swahili is used in East Africa. Forty African languages are spoken by, spoken by one million people or more, and six are spoken by ten million people or more. Africans had their own belief systems before the Christians and the Muslims arrived to convert them. Despite cultural diversity, many people of Sub-Saharan Africa believe in spiritual forces which manifest everywhere in the natural environment and in fact affect people's daily lives, rewarding the virtuous and punishing those who misbehave. Colonialism brought Christianity, and 30% of the realm's population is now Muslim. Sub-Saharan Africa is the least urbanized world realm. Although world realm, although people are moving into towns and cities at a rapid pace. More than 300 million people live in towns and cities, but the infrastructure of the cities has not kept up with migration, and many urban immigrants cannot find work and live in poverty. Colonialism left its mark on Africa in the form of a fragmented political map, chronic instability and corruption. Colonial forces pulled out of Africa, or were first out of Africa, and had no incentive to attempt to repair the damage that they caused. There are a few stable democracies, but most countries are not so lucky. Economic legacies are also distraught. There are some attempts at regional and continent-wide cooperation. Despite the stereotypes, Sub-Saharan Africa includes six of the top ten countries that are exhibiting the fastest economic growth, according to the IMF. GDP is growing, population rates are declining, and Sub-Saharan Africa could be poised as a future emerging market. 